been living here since 01. So what is it, 2018? So I've been here for 17 years. Love the Midwest. You guys are in a great area of the country. And unfortunately, or maybe even fortunately, I was involved in 9-11. So I got to experience the World Trade Centers, which is unfortunate for everyone in the world, especially Americans. But it's fortunate in the way that I was able to feel it, experience it, and I'd be able to relay my story to everyone. And there was thousands of people there who were doing the same thing every day, telling the story. But what makes it a little unique for me is I'm out here. And there's not a lot of people in Chicago or the Midwest who, would, who got caught up in the World uh, Trade Centers. Um, so I am 49. So when 9-11 happened, I was approximately like 32-ish. I was single. Um, and I'll kind of, I'll go through the day, because I know you guys are under a tight time frame. I'll go through the day real quick, and then I love opening up the questions. So uh, I want to hear what you guys, any questions you might have. The media has done a great job of talking about it. It's not really a polarizing issue where we're seeing in politics right now. Everyone agrees 9-11 was a bad event. Yeah. Um, so here we go. So 9-11, it was a beautiful day, kind of like today. Really kind of brisk. It was windy, and it was just a nice, like, fall breeze, even though it was still summer, but fall breeze coming down Manhattan. So Manhattan looks like Florida, or looks like a peninsula. It's an island, but it kind of looks like there's downtown, midtown, where the uh, um, Empire State Building is. Downtown is where the World Trade Center is, and the New York Stock Exchange. And then in the middle, it's this kind of gap where there's really just smaller buildings. So if you ever, if you guys have ever been to New York or seen it from the, from the air, you can see it, like there's downtown and then the Gap and then there's Midtown. And then there's Central Park, then there's Harlem, then there's like George Washington Bridge and the Bronx. So it's a, it's a very easy laid out city. So the, it's early, it's, it's around 8.45, 8.50 a.m. and the stock market opens up at 9.30 a.m. And that's when a lot of people like myself, I'm involved in the stock market, that's when our, that's when it's game time, 9.30, that, that is kickoff. Like you have to be at your desk, ideally before it, but you have gotta be at your desk at 9.30. So usually before then you're running around, you're doing research, you're getting coffee, you're getting breakfast, and it happened to be right before nine o'clock, so I'm running around, I'm in the basement of the World Trade Center. So the World Trade Center, it should be really called the World Trade Centers. It's two huge towers, the size of the Sears Tower, or Willis Tower, there's two of them. And they're right next to each other. And then in the basement, or they call it the concourse, it's another five floors. So it's like taking a mall and putting it underground. That's how big this, this whole area is. And then there's like a main road called the West Side Highway, and across the street there's like another mini World Trade Center complex called the World Financial Center. All this is confusing to anyone, except when you work there, it's really easy. And you're right on the Hudson River, and then there's New Jersey right across the river. And um, so we're all kind of running around, everyone's doing their thing, the market hasn't opened up yet, market being the stock market. And all of a sudden, I'm in the basement of the World Trade, making my way up to the World Financial Center, where this briefcase was, and I was around the 10th floor working in the World Financial Center waiting for the market to open. But here I am in the World Trade Center making my way up and there is a long glass tunnel, that a bridge that connects the World Trade Center to the World Financial Center. So if you've ever been to Ogilvy train station downtown, there's this glass like bridge that connects you to sort of like Chicago. It's the same thing. So I'm in this bridge, and all of a sudden, here it comes. You hear this, boom, and you're like, and you knew it wasn't normal. It didn't, there's a lot of noises in Manhattan, but it wasn't normal, it was really loud. So being that it's a glass bridge, you instinctively look to where the noise came from. But it sounded like it was coming from Midtown. So you're sort of looking north, but really, because of the way sound works, that's where it was. It hit right above us to the point where you had to look like this 
and you could see what we've all seen on TV, the big hole in the, in the uh, World Trade Center. And all of a sudden you're like, wow. Now here's the weird thing, we didn't know it was a plane. I didn't know it was a plane until about six hours later. So I'm like, wow. So here, now, pause. I was caught up in the World Trade Center in the first bombing when it was in the basement. And I was on the 100th floor. I was working for Deloitte and Touche. I graduated college, I was like, and that was scary. Only a couple of people died, which was tragic, but it wasn't nearly what 9-11 was gonna turn into. So, being that I was already been through this thing, I'm like, I'm out of here. I don't know what that was that put that hole in that thing. It looked like a missile. But it didn't look good. I know we're all kind of laughed, like, dude, it was 9-11, but we didn't know. We didn't know what it was. And the market was about to open in a half hour. So you can't tell your boss, oh, there was a hole in the wall, I can't go to work. Remember, this is before 9-11, so there was no like precedent for anything like this. But I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go around, I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna hang out for a little bit because I don't want to go through it. I went through seven years earlier. So I just literally walked, I was the first one outside. I went down the escalator, walked outside. So if the World Trade Center was that white wall right there, there was a big street, and I was standing basically right here. Imagine this double in size. And all of a sudden, the first fire truck pulls up. And this is where I get, it's a little emotional, but you see these guys, and they're looking, and they're on these. And then there's like three or four or five fire trucks coming, and they're all coming here miles away. And they're all looking up, and they're like, and they know they're going to, they have to go up, they have to go up. And I learned later when a firefighter sees a fire on a high floor, there's a good chance of death for the firefighter because there's no way they're going to make it down. There's, this, there's no like parachutes right there. So they're basically looking up to their grave. And that's what the media said, and they were accurate. So all of a sudden, I'm hanging out here. By this point, there's probably hundreds of people coming out. And we're just sitting here going, what do we do? I did have, uh, cell phones just kind of came out. I had one on me. My briefcase is sitting in my office. And my friend from New Zealand calls, which is 24 hours away, you know, 12 hours in terms of time. And he goes, hey, mate, what just happened? Where are you? And I said, I'm in the World Trade Center. What happened? He goes, oh, and then it went dead. Because the antenna for all cell phones is the World Trade Center on top of it. So anyway, I still had no idea what was going on. A lot of people are coming out. And then these fire trucks are pulling up. And if you, and that's when people, and I'm only saying this because it's on TV, people started to jump from the top of the World Trade Center, where the hole was. And so if you looked underneath the fire truck, you could kind of see what would happen because the people were obviously hitting the ground. <clears throat> Luckily, we didn't look underneath the fire truck because they would be hitting where that couch was or maybe where the parking lot was. So we stayed there a little too long. So a lot of people were running. They were running back away from the buildings. I was single. I didn't have kids. My girlfriend dumped me the night before. So I was literally, I, I was just like, all right, I'll just hang out here. I don't think work is going to happen, but I don't have anywhere to go. I just, I'm going to see what happens. So the second plane hits, which everyone, a lot of people saw on TV. Where I was standing, I was too close to the World Trade Center to see the plane hit the other World Trade Center. But I do remember a big thing of fire shoot out. But I guess, I, we didn't know that was a plane. So remember guys, we still didn't know, maybe there's a couple thousand of us now, we didn't know it was planes. We thought it was a missile, a bazooka, like, uh, or a, a little Cessna. We didn't know. So then, this cop on a bike came up to me. There's maybe about 100 of us left. And he's like, guys, this building's going to fall. You have to leave. So we're like, OK. So that cop turns out to save my life. So we just turned around, and we started walking fast up the West Side Highway, which is the, the main drag that splits the World Trade Center from the World Financial Center. So we like walking up one of the main roads in, in State Street or something <coughs> in Chicago. So we're just walking up, and now there's Hundreds, 
hundreds of fire trucks and police cars. And I do remember jumping over a wheel, and it turns out it was the wheel to an airplane that hit the building. I didn't realize at the time, I thought it was like a fire truck wheel or something, but it was, I remember a big axle on it, so I think it was the wheel to one of the airplanes. So I remember looking back, and we were probably about six, seven blocks away, so maybe like where the golf, I think it was the golf course over by that intersection. We were probably that far away from if this was the World Trade Center. So I remember looking back, and everyone's pointing up, and this part is like burned in my memory. That's when you see the whole World Trade Center collapse. And it came down like a domino, like do, 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 do. And then the second one's still up, but it's on fire. And it would have just wiped us out because it would have just taken everyone down at the bottom there. And then it came over, and then this big tidal wave of dust and all that stuff came over us. And then we just started running. But it was windy enough where it was pushing it south. So we got dirty, but nothing like those guys and gals who got, you saw in the news, they were all dirty and stuff. They were stuck down in the, right by the World Trade Center. So we were about five blocks away. We got dirty, but nothing, nothing like that. And then, remember, cell phones weren't working and a lot of people didn't have cell phones. So here's where it gets kind of crazy. I bump into a guy I met, I knew from London. He happened to be having, he owned a flat, an apartment in Greenwich Village, which is near downtown. I go, hey mate, can I borrow your phone? And he goes, yeah. So I go up to his apartment, I call my parents. My parents start bawling. And I'm like, I, I'm alive, what's wrong? They're like, you told us you were at the, uh, the Windows of the World restaurant, which I did. I was supposed to be there the whole month of August and the whole month of September, which is a restaurant on the top floor of the World Trade Center for training purposes, and no one survived, and that's the first thing that hit the news. That was no survivors and windows of the world because to get there, it took three elevators. And the plane broke the elevator shaft and also took out the stairways. So there was no way of getting down. And I do remember looking up to the top floor. Again, it's like looking at the top of the Sears Tower. It's pretty far away. And all the waiters who I got to know, because that was the month of August, were waving their aprons and trying to like, what do we do? Unfortunately, they came down with the building. But um, I forgot to tell my parents, I didn't forget, I didn't think they would care, that I wasn't at the Windows of the World starting after Labor Day. So they thought I got caught up in Windows. So when I called them, they got emotional. I got emotional. I'm like, okay, guys, they, they, they live in Connecticut about an hour away. So I'm like, I'll see you when I see you. I don't know how to get out of here. Because Manhattan did a very smart thing. They shut down all the bridges all the tunnels, all the trains, because they weren't sure where the bombs were, where the terrorists were, they didn't know anything. And all you heard, which has never hit the news, is these fighter jets. Have you guys ever seen the air water show, how loud those jets are? Those jets, and this wasn't for fun, this was for like war, they were circling Manhattan, which doesn't take long, it takes about five seconds in the jet. They were just circling the island, and they were low, and they were just there for safety. And they were setting off all the car alarms because it was such a loud noise from these jets. And all of a sudden, you're like, what do I do? I mean, I had friends I could stay with, but you're kind of like, there's millions of people going, all right, it's around noon now, right? Three hours. Oh, the, the, the second building, I apologize. Second building falls. At that point, I'm, I'm, I'm in safe. I'm in the safe area. And I'm like, what do I do? So they ended up... I had a friend in New Jersey right across from the World Trade Center, which turns out was the closest spot you could be without being um, in the war zone. So you were actually allowed to go there. So for anyone going to New Jersey, which is millions of people, they turned big cruise ships that usually dock in the Hudson River, they turned them sideways. And you'd walk in one side, and you'd keep on walking, and then they would reverse the ship into the Jersey side, and you just walk off in the middle of like, some weird dock, and then it's up to you to find a way home. And then people who lived in Brooklyn, they would just walk over the Brooklyn Bridge. People who lived in Connecticut or Westchester County, that's equivalent of living here, working downtown. They just walked all the way. There was no public transportation. So that was 9-11, awful day. So I lose my briefcase. I thought I lost this briefcase in my building because when the World Trade Center came down, 
it took out all the windows on the first 20 floors. And my window was right above George Bush's head. There's a famous picture, my favorite picture. George Bush, the president, with that retired firefighter with a megaphone. And the window of my office was right above his head. And that window was blown out. I think there was a US flag hanging over it, actually. And so I just figured this was gone. It turns out they found this briefcase. About a month later, it blew out the window when the World Trade Center came down. And it pushed it into down by Wall Street. They say it was near a cemetery. So they found this thing. I get this box. Now, at this point, I moved to Chicago. I get this, and I moved to the Sears Tower of all places. But I get this box. And it's all wrapped up, this paper box. And I'm like, what is this? And there's a couple guys who kind of gather around me from work. And I'm like, what is this thing? I cut it open. And inside was my briefcase. And it was empty. And all it had was my business card. And they tracked me down in Chicago. So I don't know who to thank. I don't know anything. They just found it, and it was a mess. It was full of all that dust and everything. So I used it for about 10 years after 9-11. So this is like my little memento of 9-11. Um, so I'm trying to make this quick. I usually, I usually can make it longer, but I want to hear all your questions. I, on the next day at 9-12, I happened to be staying next to the only newspaper shop that was putting out newspapers. So I happened to get these newspapers. So these are like some of the newspapers from that first morning after 9-11. So these are, here's the New York Times. I mean, imagine, and they, all these, they couldn't even run the presses. They had to go to like Pennsylvania to run this to get these newspapers because all their presses and all their media was in downtown Manhattan. So these are some, for a lot of, no, no, let's see. You guys were definitely not born yet, were you? On 9-11, yeah. So here's, uh, here's two copies, and here's the Wall Street Journal. And then, uh, so that, that is, uh, so that's, the, that's when the second plane hit the second tower. I was on the other side down here, so I wasn't able to see that plane hit. So that was, um, and on 9-11, four planes hit. Two planes hit the World Trade Center, one plane hit the Pentagon, and one plane crash landed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, which was supposedly targeted for Washington, for the uh, White House. So it was a really bad day for everyone. I happened to be in it. But I'm no hero. I just happened to be there. It was just a really sad day for America. What a lot of people say was our generation's Pearl Harbor. Because it really was the first mass casualty on United States land since Pearl Harbor that happened in the 1940s. So with that, I know you're on a tight, tight, tight deadline here. I'd love to hear um, if you guys have any questions about what I saw or maybe your Keep on talking. So, yep. Did your friend from London uh, stay alive? I'm sorry. Was your uh, friend from London did he stay alive? My friend from London. Uh, you know, it's funny. I haven't talked to him since. I haven't talked to him since 9/11. So it was just a mutual. It was a casual uh, friend. Um, my friend from New Zealand is still alive. I haven't talked to him since 9/11. A lot of people ask me, what were the people around you like? When I was running from the World Trade Center, when that cop, who again saved my life and saved all our lives, because we were the only people still there, um, people were very mellow. Like New Yorkers are really, they're tough on the outside, but they're really good people because they just, to live in New York is tough. It's expensive, it's kind of dirty, it's, it's hot or it's cold. It's expensive. People commute two to three hours a day one way just to work in there. So people are pretty resilient. Um, that obviously was a crazy day. Um, but everyone around me was pretty mellow. Um, there was one woman on a bike. She kind of looked like a witch, actually. But she looked kind of crazy. And I just remember her biking on this like three-speed bike with like, this long, stringy hair. And she had this cackle. And she's like, there are bombs on the street. There are bombs on the street. So all of a sudden you're thinking, that sounds crazy. But then again, this whole day's been crazy. Why wouldn't there be bombs on the street? So then people started like, 
freaking out. They weren't, they weren't sure where to run. People were running on the streets in front of fire trucks because that's where they knew it was safe because fire trucks, they would have been blown up if there were bombs on the street. Um, I do remember a lot of ambulances and cop cars coming back out of ground, out of the World Trade Center with blown out windows with people who, who were injured or maybe dead on top of the cars because there was no ambulances. They were just driving with these people. I do remember walking past a lot of hospitals, and this is really sad. All the hospitals were open and they had all the surgeons and all the doctors from the ER lined on the streets ready for all these mass casualties, but there weren't any. Very few people got hurt because a lot of people, you either made it out or unfortunately you went down with the, with the building. I knew a couple people, I knew of them through other people who, um, made it out and then went back in to help their friends and they didn't make it out. Um, our church in Connecticut, we have a, um, our pastor did a really nice statue for, we lost six people in our parish. Um, anyone in the New York metro area, which is huge, like three or four times the size of the Chicago area, um, everyone lost people. No one, no one got through 9-11 without losing a dad or a mom. I'm still friends with someone from a high school class. She lost her brother. We just got married like a week earlier. And then you hear the other side of the stories. You hear stories like mine that I was supposed to be there, but I wasn't. So it is what it is. Um, it's just a bad, bad day. Yeah, question? As, as you, as the day unfolded, uh -huh. when did you start to realize? Oh, I forgot that, I forgot that point. Great question. So I walked across this ferry, cruise ship, and I was staying in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is literally a golf shot, a very long golf shot, a couple football fields on the World Trade Center. So I got off, I walked about five miles south, back down to uh, where I was staying, and it's a younger area, young single area, it's like Lincoln Park. So there was nowhere else to go but to go to a bar. Um, and I don't mean like to have fun, but you didn't want to like sit on your couch. You wanted to be out with people. You wanted to commiserate. So I, I, I found the first bar. I walk in there, and there was a young bartender, and it was just me and him. And he's like, were you caught up in that? And I'm like, yeah. And I look up, and there's a TV, and that's when I noticed it was two airplanes that hit. It wasn't this one. So I noticed it around 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock that afternoon. that afternoon. Bush spoke that evening. He looked like he was a deer in headlights. He looked much better the next day. Um, I remember weird things, like the next morning, and it sounds so callous and shallow, but I remember being on the treadmill in the apartment complex I was staying at, running on the treadmill, staring at ground zero, which was a big cloud of smoke. But you're like, you just kind of stay in your routine. I guess there's really nothing else to do. Work was canceled for the week. Um, I had a wedding that weekend that he actually ended up having, but there was very few people at the wedding, including his best man. There were jets circling the whole week after 9-11, so there was car alarms going off for a week. I know it sounds minor, but if you hear a bunch, like 30 car alarms, it starts to, you start to go nuts. Um, and then all you, all you could see for a week until I got out of there was a big cloud of smoke over, nine, over ground zero, they call it. Um, and at night you could hear just the hum of all the uh, equipment and all the removal stuff. And there's big, big, huge spotlights that lit up the whole downtown that was focused on these people just taking apart all the rafters and all, and all, the, um, and all the stuff trying to find survivors. I don't think they found if you make it to Manhattan, you, you must, if you are if you have a good stomach, you've got to go to the 9-11 Museum. It's, it's brilliantly done. I waited my whole adult life to take my whole family there. And I'm, I go there a bunch because I'm for work and I'm from there. But I finally took my three kids and my wife there. And I thought it was a, and it was a big deal to me, emotional. I took them all down. I told my three kids, this is where I stood. 
and kids being kids, they're like, Dad, you know, I go to the bathroom, I need water, I need a pretzel. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a minute, but this is like where I stood. So it was kind of a nice humor. It, it was, it kind of broke up the seriousness of the day because you forget if you guys weren't in it or you weren't born, it, it's not as significant as for us older people who live through it. And if you ask anyone who's an adult in your life where they were on the morning of 9-11, I guarantee you they will tell you, as long as you can stay patient, they'll be there 20 minutes, a half hour, an hour, they will tell you where they were. Because it, they will never, ever forget. There are certain events in your life that you will never forget where you were. I wasn't born yet, but when JFK was shot, that was the big deal. Like every, every adult of that generation knew where they were when JFK was shot. Everyone in our generations know where they were on 9-11, right, for the, for the older people, or everyone knows where they were on 9-11. We heard the news, it was a big, um, it was a big, big deal. Um, yep. Uh, do you believe in all of the conspiracy theories? No, okay. no, it's ridiculous. So, uh, in my opinion, um, it, it's it's rare to actually live th live through something that the conspiracy theory is on. The question was, like everything else, there's a lot of conspiracy theories. One was like it was done by Israel; they wanted to kill all their own people. There was one that it didn't really happen; it was an illusion. I, and I remember the next morning, I'm waiting in line to get some food, and a woman turns around and says, well, guess what, America deserved it. Yeah. And that's not a conspiracy theory, that's just her statement. Hey, it's America, you're allowed to say that. But that's the equivalent of burning a flag, like the day after the Civil War. I mean, it's like, and I remember, I, was, I couldn't even speak, I was so shocked by it. And this guy <laughs> behind me reaches over and grabs her, and then, he stops and then he realizes, okay, she's just, she's whacked. So you hear statements like that, that you're like, are you kidding me? Like 2,000 plus people died innocently. For what cause? And I don't want to get political, but I mean, just died. So you do hear a lot of comments beyond the crazy conspiracy theories that are more like, if, once you leave America's soil, you go to Europe, you'll hear a lot of things like, well, you had it coming or whatever. And that, that gets me. It gets triggered everyone upset. Yeah. Um, after this happened, did it Yeah, good point. So they call it post traumatic syndrome. And just and I thought I was a tough guy. I thought I didn't have any of that. I do remember I was staying at a friend's house in uh, Georgetown, DC, Washington, DC. <coughs> and it's cobblestone roads in parts of Georgetown, and I remember this big, turned out to be like a garbage truck, went underneath his window and hit cobblestone. This is like a year after I left. And I jumped out of bed, and I ran into, he was married, I ran into their master bedroom, and I'm like, guys, did something just hit the, uh, did something just hit? And I remember him going, and he, he's high up in the Senate in, at the time, and he goes, let me check, and that was back when it's called blackberries and stuff. And he's like, nope, nope, we're fine, but just, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. But I remember being very, um, I got nervous around loud noises. And then I still, to this day, I'll be down, I work downtown in Chicago, and there will be big airplanes that are allowed to fly right over the loop. And I'm still looking, at, and I still stare at those a little longer than most people, because that's what it looked like I never saw it live, but that's what it looked like on TV when the planes hit. And by the way, it was just announced that we are moving to the 85th floor of the Sears Tower. So I'm going back into the, the biggest building, the second biggest building. I heard, um, well, I don't know for sure, they said uh, a plane was supposed to come to Chicago and hit the Sears Tower. That was a plan, but. Yeah, I think that was a Shanksville. Yeah, I remember that. I think. There was a lot of theories. I do remember running. That was a theory I heard later, uh, but I, so I don't know. I don't think. So. I, I think that was dispelled. I don't think that was a theory. But I do remember when I was running from the World Trade Center, there was a lot of different rumors, like the White House was bombed, uh, Bush is dead, uh, 
Pentagon was hit, which turned out to be accurate. Um, just some weird stuff. And not, you don't blame people. Remember, like, you guys are all used to having cell phones. This is back when there was nothing. I remember passing by bars in downtown Manhattan or lower Manhattan, and there were people literally, like, trying to watch the big, these aren't flat screens, these are big TVs, just to see what's going on in their own area. Because there were so many cops and ambulances and fire trucks, you didn't really know what was going on, and you couldn't ask anyone because no one knew. And the firemen were so busy, you couldn't really ask them. So it was a, uh, it was different. For, for the younger generations, it was just harder back then to get information. Yep. Um, personally, from my experience, I wasn't, you know, age, but I was in high school. And I remember like weeks after that, I still, even though I wasn't there, it was like, okay, is it gonna be another retaliation or yeah. since they hit Chicago? Like even though I, I was hearing loud noises, I was like, man, it, it's, it's coming again. Yeah. Even though I wasn't there, I still had that post-traumatic. We, we, we all did. Yeah. yeah. You know. I mean, people, uh, a lot of people I worked with quit because they refused to work at a, uh, in an elevator. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people moved back to where their parents lived. They just wanted to get home. So like if you were living in Alabama, you are like, I'm out, I'm done. Um, I moved away because I've been through it twice and I needed a change anyway. I was single, I'm like, I'm out, I'm gonna move to Chicago. Um, and I had other reasons why I, I should move. But, um, Uh, yeah. So when after you're outside the building, you didn't know what was going on. Was the sense of everyone was everyone like in like super high panic mode, or most people just didn't know what was going on? Because I was thinking when we're watching it here in Chicago, yeah, I was freaking out here. We're a thousand miles away. You guys are right there. You know, if more is coming, you don't really don't have any shelter or anything. You know what it felt like? It felt like being at a stadium like Soldier Field or United Center and you kind of felt the movement towards the exit. Like there was a general flow. So where I was standing there was a general flow to the north which would be away from the World Trade Center. But it, you could have easily just stayed there and not you wouldn't be pushed. Like I stayed there too long, but I wasn't like caught up in the crowd where I was being pushed away. There was still enough space that if you wanted to do anything, you could. But there was a vibe where there was a general, like people, if you just followed like the, the, the sort of the motion, that would lead you away. There was a group of people near me. It's a great question, I've never talked about this. There was a group of people near me that went to the Hudson River which I know it's hard, I'm, I'm thinking where I'm standing, which would be like, you know, where those trees are way over there. That was the Hudson River. And there were boats, and there's YouTube videos on this, they're fascinating. All the boats from everywhere in the Hudson River, private, commercial, ferries, tugboats, they all came to this little area and people were jumping on them. And they were just getting people away. They didn't care where they were going, just get me away from ground zero because they didn't know if there were bombs or if there were more planes coming. Um, and that's a great, you could YouTube it, uh, you could find it, it's easy. Uh, Tom Hanks narrates it, the one that's really popular. But, um, so there was a flow of people going to the water, people were jumping in the Hudson. Um, there was a flow of people that were moving away from it. There definitely was not a flow of people going into the building, obviously, or even going around it. They were just getting away from it. Um, I think I saw some other. Yep. What would you tell these younger people yeah. when they find themselves in a situation that they may not have control or they may not know where to go or what's my next step? Sure. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. All the So two things. To answer that question, in all buildings downtown, have to have a, every, I think, three months or six months, the fire department comes and you do a fire drill or an evacuation drill. We used to call them in our generation fire drills, but now it could be anything, an evacuation drill from a terrorist attack or a shooter or something, I don't know. 
people are grudgingly like they they always kind of go to these things and my big boss always says just talk to Steve talk to Ploder he'll tell you how serious to take these things and then that's when everyone kind of finds out my past but you've got to listen to you don't have I mean you can take it really serious and before you walk into a movie theater look to where the exits are I, I personally don't and maybe you should but Panic is the worst thing, and people realize they got all these airplanes that kind of have issues. People throw all their logic out the window, and they just do what's natural, which is scream and run and grab things. You definitely don't want to walk in high heels. You definitely don't want to carry anything with you. Like in the first bombing in the World Trade Center, for people who are on the 100th floor, we had to walk down 100 flights of stairs. People at that point were in high heels, they were carrying like water, and all of a sudden, it's inevitable, it's gonna spill. So people were slipping, there was a pregnant lady who passed out, and now all of a sudden, oh, and the emergency lights didn't work. So you had 100 flights of stairs, which is, that's a long time. And then you had firemen walking up one side of the stairs with big hoses that were weighing about 100 pounds. So my advice to anyone is try to take a deep breath, Think logically, try not to panic, and don't grab anything. Nowadays, maybe <coughs> grab your phone, but don't, just grab your kids if you can and move. Just get away. Don't stay around like I did. Just get away. You'll watch it on the news, whatever's happening. Nowadays, people are out there videotaping right now. I mean, just get away. I mean, you just don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so on September 11th, I was talking to some of the teams about 9-11. This yeah. is actually how it all came up to invite sure. you. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah. But one of the things I was trying to explain, it was so hard, is um, how have things changed? Pre-9-11, post-9-11, in yeah. your eyes. Well, for example, so I was, in the, I was involved in the World Trade Center twice, and I have no problem moving to the Sears Tower to one of the top floors you could work in in the country, in the world, in the world. I have no problem. I think it's safer than it has been ever. I think people take it more serious. I think people look around now when they, and I work in, I've always worked in big buildings, you know, people don't let just anyone in. Um, you kind of look at people when they're waiting by the door and you might have a pass and you kind of look and you just have to ask them like, oh, is there anything I can help you with? I'm looking for John Doe, okay. I'll tell you what, grab a seat, let me go in here, I'll be happy to grab it. Like, those things I don't think existed before 9-11 or before all these other sort of bad things have been happening um, with people in general. Um, so I think people are much more aware, and I think what's great about human beings is that we do have a short memory in a way that we have to exist and we evolve and we just go through life and we learn from our lessons and we just try to get bigger and better, but you can't hide, this is my opinion, you can't use 9-11 as an excuse to sit in your basement and play Fortnite the rest of your life. Rest of your life. I know a lot of you guys would love to, I know my kids would love to. But you have to get out there and you have to live life. And you can't be afraid of what's around the corner. You just have to accept it. And if it's your time, it's your time. Um, so yeah. Yep. No, it, you know, it didn't. Um, I fly a lot for work. It does, I don't ever think about it. Um, you know, I'm obviously a six, I'm big, I'm six foot five. I kind of have this feeling like I'm American. No one's going to tell me what to do. I do get nervous sometimes, but that's just when everyone else would get for obvious reasons. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm very blessed, I'm very lucky that way. I don't have any post-traumatic stuff. It's actually probably the opposite. I feel more invigorated. <coughs> You're not taking my country from me. I became much more patriotic. Right. Um, I believe in, we have a great country. Patriotic, what do you mean by that? Patriotic meaning that it's, especially for all our generations, we didn't have 
a war. We didn't have Vietnam from, from any of us, right? So we never, we never had a fight for our country. I mean, physically, I mean, some of us did, but in the, in the big, big wars. So to me, 9-11 was the first time where we could really say to ourselves, wait a minute, people attacked us. And for, for many of us, that we felt it was wrong. That's wrong. And this is a great country. And their statement was, we, I don't want to, I mean, this is sensitive, but I mean, we, we want to get rid of America. We want America gone. That was what they believed in. And I'm like, along with everyone else, is like, no, this is America. This is our country. We're standing tough. You're not going to take our America away from us. So that's what I mean by patriotic. Uh, yeah? Did you ever think about, like, going back to the people? You know, that's a great, I was asked that at elementary, uh, middle school a couple years ago. And uh, I hate to say it, no. Can you Never. repeat the question? Oh. Did I ever think about going back into the building and helping people? And the answer was, I have to admit, it didn't even cross my mind. Um, I don't feel bad about that, I just, no. Um, it wasn't like there was a door that was there and you would run in, but that maybe be an excuse too. The answer is no, no. So how far were you going to do I would, when the plane hit, I was like in this a couple floors up. But um, you couldn't see the plane hit; you could hear it. But remember, like when when you, like when you hear a car go really by fast, you always kind of look back, and it's already over there. Or when you hear a plane in the sky, it's always like way over here. Same thing, even when it's that low, you, you hear it, but you look like where it was. But when it hit the building, it, it, I don't. Know. I can't remember if it was shook or not, but it was so loud that you knew something wrong happened. In these big cities, like when you when you make noises, this echo, so you're kind of used to noises. But this one was there was no mistake; it was something bad, um, and then stuff was falling. Stuff was constantly falling down, and then you had people sort of jumping. Um, yeah, and then it smelled like. Um, you hear a lot of these cases recently where people are, um, they have a lot of lung issues, people are dying. Because people who were there, all the firemen and all the first responders, they were breathing in all this asbestos and all this bad stuff. And I don't think they're in here. But I took pictures after 9 11. Oh, oh. You're there. So these are pictures five days or four or five days later. Just pass these around. This was taken from where I was staying in Hoboken, and that's ground zero. That smoke, that, that smoke stayed there. No, that just passed away. That, that smoke stayed there for about three weeks. So that all that stuff was being um, was being breathed in for about a month. And, and this was before people um, sorry, I had all these like, goodies in there. Yeah, so this is my uh, World Trade Center ID card. <laughs> you can tell I was a little uh, younger then. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so you can see that smoke. That smoke was what people were breathing in for months. I think I took that a week later, and you can still see all the smoke there. Um, yeah. I think it took about a month. That's crazy. So my first job in 1991 was working for Deloitte and Touche on the 100th floor of the World Trade Center. So I was uh, 22. And I remember standing in those narrow windows on the 100th and first floor going, and this is before 9-11, going, God, how crazy this building fell. And we just always thought the building would fall this way. But it, it falls like a domino. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have time. Um, I have time. Yeah. How are we? I, I think we're okay. Coral? Yeah. Yeah. Any more? Uh, there was a question. Up there. Yeah, you bet. Um, how long did you know how long did you For the fire department? 
it, that first fire truck showed up instantly. instantly. There is a fire, if you ever make it to the 9 11 memorial, there is a firehouse that is right next to it. And all the firehouses in Manhattan, especially lower Manhattan, all have these beautiful memorials for all the guys they lost in 9 11. They lost about half. Some houses, like the one right by the World Trade, lost more than half their guys. So that first fire truck pulled up, which I think is one of the ones that's in the museum, Thanks. which is one of the ones in the museum. If you go to the 9 11 Memorial Museum, they have a fire truck that was caught up and then we got crushed, but they, they, they took it out of world, they took it out and put it in the museum, and it's amazing. It's all blown out and stuff. Um, so those first five or six fire trucks never, they just got crushed when the first building fell on top of it. Yeah. So we were Yeah. Uh, no, but I went to Can look at Can you repeat my, the question? We'll get yeah, to oh, I'm sorry. The question was, do I ever think it could happen again, especially where I, I work in big buildings? And the answer is, um, no, I, I honestly don't. But we just took a tour of my new floor on the 85th floor. And I'm on the 54th floor now, which is pretty high up. Now on the 85th floor. So you can see Wisconsin, you can see Michigan, you can almost see, they say Iowa, which I don't but, but you could, it is weird, because you're higher than the plane. So you can see planes landing at O'Hare, and you're like looking, I mean, you're looking over them, and then the planes at Midway, I remember looking at them, you can see the pilots. I mean, they're right there. So it's kind of, kind of, it's kind of freaky. And a lot of the guys I was with had to stay away from the window. They got like, so the answer is I don't, the answer is no, but now my new building, it might be a little different because I'm pretty high up. You know, one of the things that uh, I wanted you guys to think about is how many people do you know, relatives or friends who joined the military or who have been in the military? Because before 9-11, Joining the military was not something a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there wasn't a major conflict. Mm -hmm. And we were still rebounding from Vietnam as far as still regaining <coughs> the respect that mm -hmm. the military should have had. And I, and I wonder if any of you guys have relatives who have served. Your cousin, did he go overseas? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yes. Your right. Okay. And, and and I think that you know before this happened, a lot of people would say, "No, I don't know anyone who directly served." But now I think we've all, in some ways, we know somebody, Isaiah. Who is one of our unit directors? Uh, he he served in Afghanistan, I believe. So so it, now it, it was it's more common, and people wanted to do it. Yeah, you know, they couldn't keep them. The, the, they kept the um, recruiting stations open 24 hours a day because the lines were out the door. This is the first year. I just heard this on the news, ironically enough, a couple days ago. This is the first year since 9/11, since 2001 that they couldn't fill their quota. And before 9-11, like you were saying, it was always a struggle. They had to offer yeah. more incentives, more money, and it's the first year, so 17 years, they were able to fill their, their quota every year and then some until this year. And that's almost like a whole generation when you think about 17 years. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What so anyway, I, I go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just wonder what, yeah. Do you, what do you guys think about where we live and, and, our, and our country? And, and, you know, there's a lot of goofy things that go on, but are you glad to live in the United States? I, and, and I ask 
ask that seriously because there are many countries where we wouldn't be able to say the things that we can say. We wouldn't be able to give an opinion mm -hmm. about what we think about the president without having some type of punishment come our way. We could be doing this. Right. No more. <coughs> right. Yes. I'm kind of grateful that I was born in the United States because my dad, he was born in Somalia. Somalia? And does he talk to you about how, how it's different here? And does he talk about living here in a, in a good way? Yeah, he does. And, and, you know, I, I'm trying to get some perspective because my perspective is limited. I've got another question. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I was just going to say, so last night was like the first night ever, I think, uh, because of the storm. We went without lights. We still don't have lights at our house. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, since last night till now, we still don't have lights at our house. So it was like really weird for me because I was like, I'm hot. <laughs> I don't have lights. You know, uh, waking up halfway through the night, and I was like, okay, you know, um, and I had my six year old who was like, we can't go to sleep without any lights. He's like, we gotta fix them. And I'm like, no, we don't. I was like, we're going to sleep in the dark at night. You know, I'm grateful that we have a roof over our head because so many people don't. And just explaining that even to a six year old, like, he didn't get it. But me, myself, I was like, I'm so accustomed to have all these things to have a building, you know, there's people who live in huts and sleep on dirt and, you know, to be grateful to have a bed and a building and lights to, you know. You don't, yeah. you don't know what you well, have. Well, we still uh, suffering from the, the uh, hurricane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was yeah. some months, months ago. Yeah. So we still yeah. suffering from Well, Puerto Rico. I do. I mean, it's I different uh, perspective. much, different. much, much different perspective. Um, just last night, you reminded me there was that storm. So we had a three hour commute to get home last night because Metro basically just stopped halfway. Normally a 42 minute express turned into three hours. Okay. And I remember people freaking out. And I do, I did learn a couple things from 9 11 along with all of America, but I do remember saying at times when like, I miss a flight or something, I'm like, you know, th these are these are good problems to have. If I have to sit on a train that's air conditioned, I have all my electronics, and I miss my daughter's volleyball game, yeah, life could be a lot worse. And I, I was thinking about this person, because um, I just got a text message from the, the, uh, daughter, the sister of the gentleman her brother who died in 9-11. And I was thinking of her going, yeah, I mean, that, it's okay to be three hours delayed on an air conditioned train. Life could be worse. Okay. I mean, I won't tell you age, but uh, when you were at 9 11, after 9 11, post 9 11, uh, did you ever think about, like, man, I mean, I should join the Army and make a Yeah. Or, God, you guys are tough. So I didn't run in the building. And I didn't. Um, no. No, fair question. No one's judging here. No, no. I'm the, uh, I'm that Wall Street guy everyone hates. Uh, no, I did, I was 30, two, 31. No, I'm 40, I'm 49 now. So I was 32. Um, no, I did not think of it. I'm a huge military guy now. Um, that doesn't mean I like to, I read all the SEAL team books. I see all the, I'm like your guy who's like the armchair quarterback. Like, I pretend I was in the military, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> so I am definitely guilty of that. I have been told though, if I was younger, I would have done, and I, I, I swear I would have done this. I would have done ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, oh. and I would have done ROTC at my school, and then I would have went into the military because I do believe in it. I think it's a great, it's a great place to go. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. no, no, go ahead. Yeah. It has nothing to do with 9-11. All right. Um, 
So she said you were big, uh, um, your big shot. Yep. I'm sorry, but how did you feel when Kaepernick took the nil? Oh, that stuff, oh, we're getting political here. Uh, I, I, well, I feel very strongly about the flag. Mm -hmm. So I feel that's America. I believe in everyone is allowed free speech. Mm -hmm. You can't yell like, you know, house is on fire. You can't do that kind of free speech right. if, if your house is not on fire. Mm -hmm. um, but there's certain things I just think are sacred, and I just think the U.S. flag is sacred. But I also admit that that's just my belief. So I do think there's certain, I mean, so I think there's forums and there's places that people could express their views and help with the <clears throat> respective communities that they are focusing on. I don't think when it comes to like the flag or something that is on national TV, I, that's not, that's my opinion. But on the flip side, I can see their argument, which is like, well, this gets the most attention, so I'm going to do it. I'm okay with it, but I would love to know how many of those people actually follow through with it and actually are really doing work with whatever cause that they're fighting for. Oh, good question. I have a question. Yeah. So, I know that you're a spiritual person uh -huh. and philosophical, uh -huh. and I think some of our teens are spiritual as well. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, as you went through your journey in 9-11, did you ever think of, you know, a higher power was at work? Yeah. Um, we are both friends with uh, Colonel Tim Rayner. And uh, do you know Tim? Yeah. yeah. So Tim Rayner is a Colonel of the Marines. He's also head of a chief O'Hare, American Airlines pilot. One of my best friends. And he's very spiritual. And he's one of my, there's a rule of thumb, guys. You should always have role models in your life. It doesn't have to be parents. Or so, can, so I, I try to have like certain friends that are just, I look up to. And hopefully they look up to me, but I look up to these guys. And Tim Rayner is one of my spiritual guys. And he's fought, he, he flew, he was offered to fly for the Blue Angels as fighter jets. And he chose to get married to Cooper instead. And he would never, ever tell you that. But I got it out of him. And I'm like, you're a really good fighter pilot. And he's like, well, you know, I was one of the best in the world. But I mean, I had to get it out. He would never tell you that. And I said, what was it like? And he's like, I saw behind the curtain. And I said, what does that mean? And he goes, I saw death. I saw people flying next to me that their just exploded, or they get shot down, or they make a wrong turn and they bump into their other friend in the jet and they both die. And I'm like, wow, that's heavy, heavy stuff. And he goes, Steve, you saw some heavy stuff too. I said, I know, but I wasn't fighting for America. You were fighting for America. And he goes, you know something? And this is where it gets spiritual. He goes, don't ever forget, and I'll insert it in his opinion, don't ever forget that America, God puts on a pedestal. It's a special place. And this is Tim's opinion, but over the years, I'm starting to almost see it like, like he believes, and he wouldn't mind sharing, he wouldn't mind sharing this, that it's a special place. And God has a special place for America because it was created, it was almost, in his mind, and in many others, it's such a special place how it's created, and it's new, it's a new country versus like Europe. And God has like a wing towards America. He looks out for America. And I'm like, that was really kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds kind of selfish, like what about the other countries? But I've always thought about that. I don't think he has any idea that I ever even remembered that story, but I think about it all the time, how special we have it in this country. And if you don't have a special, because we all have family members, or even ourselves maybe, who life's thrown some bad curves, it is a great country where we could start over again. America is the only place you could de declare bankruptcy. And I'm talking business also, but you could declare de de bankruptcy, and people actually respect that. They're like, okay, cool, just try again. You can't declare bankruptcy in other countries. They look at you, you're looked down upon. Here it's like, yeah, go for it. If you fail, go again, go again. People love those kind of stories. Like the guys who started Amazon, Google, they all tried 10 times and then they made it big. It's like, that's the American dream. So there's a lot of, um, I kind of took it sideways there, that question, but there's a lot of, um, I, I do think it was a wake up call and I do think um, there's a lot of connections 
to faith and bake what happened on that day. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I want all you guys to think about is the fact that you live in the United States. It's, it's like you won the lottery in the world's population. Okay? You have more resources available to you in this country than 95% of the people in the world. You have water that comes out of a, a tap. You have a roof over your head. And even though you may think or people may tell you that you don't that you're not something special or that you're not good enough to be what you want to be, don't let them plant that in your head because you are here for a reason and you have a tremendous amount of opportunities ahead of you. And what 9-11 was about, you know, one of the things is that other countries want to take away some of the freedoms that we have. Other countries want you to think like they think. Here, we have a chance to choose how we think. You have a chance to take a knee during a national anthem if you want to do that. And that's because we live in this country that gives us these freedoms. And you guys have the ability to really make yourself who you want to be. So don't, don't let other people discourage you from following your dream, because you still have that opportunity. You guys won the lottery. Where's my money? <laughs> yeah. Your seat, believe it or not, people would pay you easily a million dollars to swap it. There is someone out there in some country that could pay you a million dollars right now. Don't. It's not worth it. That's how much your seat is. So make the most of it. So I think, you know, at the Boys and Girls Club, one thing that we want to expose you to is people who have, who have overcome great challenges. And I know that each of you in your lives will face challenges. And some of you are facing challenges right now. And to have Mr. Floater here come talk to us about surviving 9-11 and overcoming significant challenges related to that is, I hope that you find that to be very inspiring. So thank you for your attention today to all of you. Thanks for being here. And most of all, thank you to Mr. Slugger. So, oh, my pleasure. you know, this came up because of our conversation. <laughs> so that day I called him and I said, would you mind coming talk to our team? Absolutely. He said, and I love what he said. I feel it's my duty as an American citizen to share my story and to share it with others who may not know a lot about my life. So thank you so much for your time, and thank you for coming here and sharing your story with us. I personally found it very inspiring, and I know that my team will take away a lot from this. So thank you so much. You bet. Yes.